Hi everybody, I'm Tim from TroutandFeather.com and in this fly tying tutorial I'll be sharing with you a variation of Landon Meyer's mini jig leech. Why a variation you wonder? Well just look behind me. You can see the North Platte River. I'm really close to Casper, Wyoming. I'm on a fishing trip right now with my buddy Rob Giannino from the Fly Fishing Journeys podcast. We're fishing with Ryan Anderson of WyomingFlyFishing.com. We've had a blast with him so far and the fly you're about to see tied relates to it. I'm going to tell you all about the experience and everything else after the tying so stick around. You're really going to enjoy this one. Here's a look at Landon Meyer's mini leech. This has been just a really great pattern for me over the years. Then I decided to change this one just a little bit and the changes are very subtle. The obvious one is that it's on a jig hook. We're gonna talk about those other changes coming up right now. Here we go in my Stonfo Transformer Vice. I have a Honic Competition hook. It's their H450BL. That BL designation stands for barbless. I'm tying this leech in a size 10, which tends to be on the smaller size for me for these leech patterns. I really love this H450 hook. I've been using them for the last few years. You've probably seen them featured in a lot of my videos. They have just a really nice wide gap. They're extremely sharp. They're barbless and they're also a jig hook. What that really helps to do is when you have them paired with the appropriate slotted bead, they tend to ride hook point up, which means they're less likely to snag. That's a great thing in my mind. For this bead, which is moving around just a little bit, it's a hazard fly fishing bead. It's a three and a half millimeter slotted tungsten and the color is silver. For our thread, we're gonna be using this Semper Fly Nano Silk. This is really cool stuff. It's 18 knot, the color's black. What you're gonna notice is it's very thin, but it's extremely tough to break. This is going down that GSP path of threads. They're really great threads. I just started recently playing around with this stuff. What I love about it is because it's so strong, I can just grab a few different colors in this 18 knot size, throw them in my travel bag. So if I'm going to a fly fishing destination or a fly fishing show or a fly tying show, I don't have to worry about carrying you know, a bunch of different colors and sizes. I can get away with this 18 knot for a lot of my fly tying applications. So it's, it's really travel friendly. The one thing that I've heard about this uh, in some of the larger diameters and some of these GSP threads is they can really be tough on scissors and they tend to dull scissors. I haven't had that experience, but what I really do is whenever I'm trimming, I don't use the upper portion of, of my scissors, not the tips. I kind of go further down into the V and there are even, even kind of instances where I'll, I'll use my, my scissors like a razor blade and slash it that way. So kind of keep that in mind. And if you have any experience with GSP threads, please uh, talk about them down below in the comment section. I really love this stuff. So what I'm gonna do with this, I'm going to just kind of lash it in directly behind the bead. And I wanna jam that bead up against the eye of the hook. So once I have that built up a little bit, then I can start wrapping down about a third of the way. We'll remove the tag end of the thread. And then we're gonna tie in our body material, which is just a green crystal flash. Now you, you have lots of different options to use for the color. Um, I also love black and red crystal flash. And we'll talk about those variations after the tying. But if I'm going with the one that I use the most, it's green. Now, whenever I trim this, I'm gonna pull away just three fibers and I wanna trim them right at that halfway point or that hank. Now, if you're gonna be tying a lot of these, pull out three, cut them in half and you'll have them ready to go. And once I have those three kind of ready, what I'm going to do is wrap them around the thread. So basically the tips are facing me and they're wrapped around on your side. I'm gonna transfer them all into my left hand and with my right hand, I'm going to wrap the thread around the hook once and then as I continue around, I'm gonna start locking these in down the shank of the hook. Now we would typically stop somewhere around right here, about where the bar would be. But in this case, I really wanna do my best to take this jig hook, which is a size 10, it's on the smaller side, but I wanna kind of ensure that I get all that flash that I can get out of this. So I'm going to continue wrapping, almost to the point where it looks and becomes uncomfortable. You're gonna tell me, stop, stop, you're going far enough. But I wanna just get a few of those extra wraps in. So when you hit the point where you think you've gone too far, add one more wrap. 
and you can wind your thread back forward. And now whenever I, I bring this crystal flush, now I have six strands because I had doubled over my three strands. As I wind forward, I don't worry so much about being really tight and maintaining a lot of pressure. It's almost looser because I want them to kind of separate. And as they separate, you can see this happening, they'll really just fill out a lot of space. If you see any of that black thread poking through, you probably can't. But if you do see any of your own thread popping through, don't worry about that. You can also kind of use that to your advantage and, and maybe kind of have a contrasting thread with that body material. Once I get it up near the front, I'm just gonna add two wraps to lock it in place. Then I'm going to lean it back and make two additional wraps going back down the shank. And what that does, it just kind of allows me that, to make it look a little bit more flush when I trim it away. Now at this point in the past, that's all I would have done to the body. But what I've realized over the years is that you tend to kind of attract larger fish with this pattern and they really beat up the fly. So I really wanna protect that body. I'm gonna add some Solaris Bone Dry. This is a UV resin. This is gonna to add to the resiliency of that material. So I'm just gonna take this brush out. It's gonna have a lot of resin on it. So I'm just gonna get rid of some of that resin around the, the top of the bottle. Then to apply it, I wanna have a little bit on my side, a little bit on your side. That top got hit. Some on the bottom. Then I really wanna make sure I hit the point where that crystal flash meets the hook. Now whenever you finish applying, what I would recommend is take a post-it note, maybe some paper towels, or just your fingers, and make sure once everything's kind of wet, you'll start to see a little bit of that resin just kind of in excess. Just take your fingers, dab once or twice, you'll pick up all that excess, and you can grab your UV light and allow this to cure for approximately 10 seconds. I'm facing an outside window, so I'm gonna let the sun kind of finish that off for me, but that's really all Solaris recommends. All right, next we're gonna to get to the all-star of this fly, and that's the pine squirrel. So these are cut in zonker strips. I purchased this pack um, of, it's called Micro Pine Squirrel Zonkers. The color is black. Looks like I purchased it from Blue Quill Angler. I believe that's Mr. Pat Dorsey's shop. However, I've never been in the shop, so I must have bought these online. Pat, thanks for sending me a pretty good pack. They're a very thin strip. Um, they're really great to use. They'll also kind of bulk up whenever they get wet, and they'll really start to weigh down the pattern. So when you pair up that tungsten bead, with this zonker strip that's absorbed a lot of water, you're gonna have a very nice and heavy fly that's gonna rest on the bottom, right where you want it. Now I've already prepped my zonker strip. I have it so it's about two times the length of this entire hook. To attach it, I'm, I'm basically going to make sure that I have a piece of the hide. Let's see if I can get that nice and clear so you can see everything. I'm gonna rest that hide right up against the bead. Just make a couple wraps in there. So now it's starting to get locked in place. Can I add super glue? Absolutely, that's up to you. Now I'm gonna really start to bear down and wrap back with a few more wraps. And that's it. Now let's take a quick peek at what we have going on here. When that fur is attached, where it's attached to the hide, on these zonker strips, they tend to get cut so that it bends one way or the other. And I want that bend of the fur going towards the rear of the hook. So again, it's about two times the length of the hook. I'd rather it be longer than shorter because I don't feel like those large fish ever nip at the back. They just seem to attack this fly near its head. So don't worry about adding a trailer hook or anything like that. What I do, it, make sure I do though, is I really want to bear down on my thread. So I went back once, forward, and I'll go back one more time. At this point, I'm gonna add my ostrich hurl. I'm gonna be using a dark gray. I'm gonna grab two of of the feathers. Let me show you what I'm going to do to kind of prep these after I trim them. All right, so I've got a couple feathers cut. And what I've noticed with this ostrich hurl is that whenever I have it and I tie it in by the tips, sometimes whenever you have this tied in by the tips, the tips don't have a lot of great fibers on them, but they do near their butts. So I'm actually gonna go down about an inch and a half or two inches from their tip and trim it. Then I'm going to tie them in by their tips. 
wrap back forward. And now, as I wind these ostrich hurls forward, I almost want them kind of pushing back against each other. So I'm gonna to try to just jam in a bunch of wraps. They look really nice. They're a very strong material and they move really well in the, in the water. That's about all I can get in there or all I wanna get in there. I'm gonna lock that in place with two more wraps. We'll trim those away. And before I whip finish, I'm gonna take my thread and I'm gonna wind through that hurl. Because again, I wanna do everything I can to protect this fly. All right, once I get back to the bead, let's go to our whip finish. There's, we'll go with six this time. I believe I have room for one more set. We'll get four, so we got a total of 10 in there. That's looking good. To lash this, I'm just gonna put tight against my scissors, and there we go with this finished mini leech on a jig hook. Just a fun pattern. Now, if you're looking at it, you're probably wondering, well, it's gonna be running upside down. Is that wing right? Well, please don't comment down below in the comment section yet. We're gonna talk about that next after I change the camera angle. But that's all there is to tie this pattern. It's a fun one. Uh, I really hope that you use these, but now let's kind of shift gears a bit. And we'll talk a little bit more about this, both from a tying and from a fishing perspective. If you're anything like me, you're going to agree that that is a very simple tie. It's also an effective fly fishing pattern, but we'll get to that in a bit. Let's take a step back and let's go through the tying just a little bit. And I have to start by getting something out of the way because I know someone out there is going to comment and say, hey, whenever this is tied on this um, jig style hook, it's going to invert in the water. And the way that I tied in that, that strip going back is going to kind of be inverted in the water as well. And we'll look upside down. Trust me, it won't matter to the fish. Can you do some other things to kind of fix that if you want? Absolutely, an easy solution is just to tie it on the inside of the hook and kind of poke a hole in it with the hook through that strip, but be careful. They tend to be very narrow strips and it can be tricky. If you get that hole poked in, it might just kind of affect the durability of that strip. So kind of keep that in mind, but play around with it any way you want. But the way that you saw me tied is the way that I prefer to fish it. Now let's go through this. Let's talk about some variations. I tied this one in black on the North Platte River, which you see behind me. They love it in brown, they love it in natural. Experiment with the colors that you think will work in your local waterway. Now let's kind of move our way through that hook. Um, do you have to coat it with that uh, Solaris Bone Dry? No, you don't, but for the body, I like it to just give that little shimmer, and I also want it to really protect it well and just make it a more durable pattern. Can you super glue the strip in whenever you tie that in? Absolutely, I've done that as well. Now the final piece is that ostrich at the front. Um, there, there are times when I'll wrap my thread back through that to really help to protect it, just to give it a little bit more longevity. However, you don't have to just tie yourself to those materials. You can also kind of experiment with some other things. Maybe you can use some type of a, a dubbing loop and just make it a little buggier out there just to get that breathability. I love ostrich hurl, but there are other options out there. Experiment, have fun with it, and see what works for you. You're going to like this one. The last piece was that hazard fly fishing bead that I used. Um, I love the silver color. That just is my go-to color. Maybe it's a confidence thing. I know people that will fish this with nothing but gold or copper. Um, there's others that like that matte black that hazard sells. It's really up to you, whichever color that you go with. Um, but I do like that slotted tungsten bead. It just gets it down to the bottom in a hurry. Now let's kind of shift gears and talk a little bit about fly fishing with this. So I was fly fishing on the North Platte River and Geez, whenever we talk about this river, there's so many great things going on, but I liked having that slotted bead versus one without it because it really just helped it to get to the bottom quick. We're fishing the North Platte in April. It was right after the flush, but basically they flushed the, the river just to get a lot of that loose silt out of the way to help the spawning beds for the rainbow trout and for the browns in the fall. So it's just a wonderful experience to be here right after that. But during that flush and immediately following it, these big leeches work really well. Now, do they work back in Pennsylvania? Yes. Do they work in New York? Yes. Do they work in Montana? Yes. So I'm not saying just tie them when you're coming to Wyoming, but definitely have them ready whenever you get here because these fish just really respond to them. 
Now, how do you fish this pattern? Well, it's really up to you. If you're fishing it behind some split shot, that will work to get it down in a hurry. You may want to go with a smaller slotted tungsten bead. If you're fishing it on a tight line rig, which I was doing quite frequently, then you may want to have that heavier one, depending on the water and the depth that you're fishing in. It was nice for me to have that heavier bead because if I was fishing a deeper pool, I could really, using that Euro Nymph thing, tight line method, I could really feel it just bouncing and crawling along the bottom. And anytime there was a hesitation, I would set the hook. The other thing that I love about having this on this jig style hook is that when it does invert, if there's a lot of debris on the bottom, you'll have basically less likely of a chance to get it snagged or to pull up that stuff and just have to clean all that gunk off of your hook. So this is my go-to pattern. I've used it all over the country. Um, hopefully you'll love it too. Now I want to kind of shift gears just a hair. I want to bring in Mr. Rob Giannino. This is my buddy from the Fly Fishing Journeys podcast, and we're going to talk a little bit about our experience fishing the North Platte. So now it's my pleasure to introduce our guest, Mr. Rob Giannino. Rob, welcome to the show. Thank you, Mr. Camisa. Hey, you're welcome. Thanks so much for being on. Um, for those of you who may not know, Rob and I are friends. We met at the International Fly Tying Symposium, and Rob asked me to be on his podcast. It was a blast, and I said, I have to find a way to get him back on my channel. Here is the opportunity. So thanks for coming on. My pleasure. So I was just telling them a little bit about the, the jig leech, our experience in North Platte. I didn't say too much. What do you want to share with everybody about just our experience here? Well, the North Platte is not uh, like a river that came to my mind right off the bat. I hadn't really knew too much about it, but when I got here to Wyoming my first time and we were drifting with Ryan, the size of these rainbows and the color and the quality were amazing. Insane. And just to be together with you, and you know me, it's all about the experience, the journey, if you will. <laughs> so the to, fly fishing journey. To be together with you and then have having Harrison here with uh, videography and photography, to have these three days together, it's been a really fun experience. Uh, I'm with you, I'm with you. And we threw out some names there. We'll kind of fill those names in as we kind of go along. Um, we floated with Mr. Ryan Anderson of wyomingflyfishing.com um, and we did a couple other things. You wanna kind of just walk through the way that we kind of picked this apart, our DIY experience and our guide experience too? Yeah, it was really fun because uh, we kind of set it up where we did a Friday, Saturday, Sunday. The first day was that Friday. We went out with Ryan in the drift boat and he kind of put us on some great fish, showed us the river, yeah. kind of put us on the ins and the outs. And we had an awesome experience, caught a bunch of big rainbows and had a lot of laughs. Yes, many. And then he gave us this great map and we used our water masses where we set up a shuttle and we did a in and out on our own. Yeah. And we got to experience the river, use our flippers and kind of get around and catch a bunch of nice fish. <laughs> you know, not as many as maybe the first day with the guide, but we <laughs> no. still had some fun. We did, we did. And then he put us on some walking spots in the Fremont Canyon where we got to wade. In your experience as a Euro Nympho with these small bugs, these light tippets, really put us on some big fish. And so we lost a couple. We lost two big ones. The big ones, the big yes. ones always do seem to get yes, away. Yes, we did. But we actually got a lot of nice 20 plus inch fish and uh, beautiful colors. Having Harrison from Black Mountain videotape and shoot those pictures. It was a great experience. Wonderful. And that's really what we're after is that yeah. experience. That's it. We're, we're after that experience. We're coming back for those two that we lost. Yes. Maybe a pair of nippers too, but we that's won't, a story we're, for another time. <laughs> we'll share that for another time. We'll share that for another time. And I just have to echo everything that, that Rob's really talking about it. Wonderful experience. As you just heard, we had the guide, the flow. We had a kind of DIY on foot. So depending on what you're looking for, the opportunities are here on the North Platte. Um, we're coming back. We'll There's no back. question. We'll be back. Before we, I kind of wrap up this video, how can people find out about your podcast? iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, or the website, flyfishingjourneys.com. It's Fly Fishing Journeys on all those locations. So thank Perfect. you, Tim. Perfect. You got it. Uh, look down below in the, in the description of this video. I'll kind of put some information about Rob down there. I'll put um, probably the link to my podcast when I was on. That's I mean, cool. why not? You got to just hear about us a little bit more, just talking, having fun. And just remember that um, whenever it comes down to size, my fish were always bigger than Rob's. Remember that. <laughs> that much. <laughs> Thanks, buddy. Thanks, Tim. You got it. Before wrapping this one up, I do want to give a special shout out to Mr. Ryan Anderson of wyomingflyfishing.com. As you just heard with Rob, we had just a wonderful experience on the river. Uh, Ryan was our guide. Just 
absolutely professional. I learned a lot while with him there. We caught a lot of fish too, which was definitely the perk. He's the owner of that, and he also has accommodations. Now his wife Liz, she's kind of that glue that kind of holds everything together and gets all those pieces moving in unison. She's kind of the one associated with this lodge where we're staying, and it's called the Dry Fly Lodge. It has two floors. We stayed on the top one. It's called the Drake. Three bedrooms. It was just perfect for us. We even had cut flowers whenever we first arrived. Like, it was a really nice place. Uh, I was here with Rob, and we also had a videographer, Mr. Harrison Hughes from Black Mountain Cinema. Everything was just perfect. So if you are looking for a space to stay where, while you're in Casper, lots of accommodations. I highly recommend this one. Well, with all of that said, thank you so much for watching this fly tying tutorial on my variation of Landon Meyer's incredible mini leech. This was the jig variation and all that fun stuff. You got a lot out of this video. Hopefully you got to hear about a podcast, the North Platte guide service, accommodations. I, what more could you want? But if you do want some more fly tying videos, you can check out my website, which is troutandfeather.com. Um, I'm also found on Instagram, on Facebook, you know all of that social media fun, and I'd love to connect with you there. Thanks so much for watching this fly tying tutorial, and I'll see all of you next time.